I'm joined today by Derek Adams. Hello, hello. <laughs> and we're here in his installation, We Came to Party and Plan, which uh, made its Museum World's debut here at the Hudson River Museum. And we're really thrilled to be able to have Derek here with us today yeah. on the final days of We Came to Party and Plan. And the last day is Saturday, right? Sunday. Yeah, Sunday, or Sunday. Sunday by 5 p.m., so get in here before that. Um, so, Derek, welcome. And here's, I wanted to tell our audience how this is going to work. Um, what I thought we'd do is we'd start off with uh, a, an intro conversation between Derek and myself. And then what I think would be really great for all of you is to hear from Derek and see Derek with, without his mask on. So I'm going to remove myself from these, the, uh, the, the, the picture so that he can actually speak like that. So um, we, we're excited to hear your questions um, as we go through this next hour together. Uh, before we start, I really would like to acknowledge some incredible people who, and, and organizations that, and foundations that made this amazing exhibition possible. So the Hudson River Museum and I would like to thank uh, the, the generous support from the Mr. and Mrs. Raymond J. Horowitz Foundation for the Arts. And the exhibition was also supported in part by the city of Yonkers, Mayor Mike Spano, Luxembourg and Diana, Rona Hoffman Gallery, and Salon 94. Uh, we also really want to thank, as you will see in this exhibition, uh, 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 22 wallpaper for the incredible custom wallpaper for this installation. And throughout this entire exhibition, we've been so proud to have wonderful, important conversations that were made possible through programs. And those programs were supported by a number of supporters, including Dr. Sharon Brenman, Charlie Lester, Cheryl Caligari, Michael Hoeg, Dwayne and Phillips and Carolina Bonsler, Lisa Simonetti, Robin Jenkins, Everett Taylor, and various friends of the museum. So thank you to all of you for making this possible. So here we are, Derek, we're in the final days of this incredible yeah. exhibition. Um, and I haven't been back since the opening. Which was uh, quite an opening. Which is quite an opening. You know, I will say the most, it's been my favorite response to my work I've ever gotten from a, from a crowd. Um, the work, you know, was really about celebration and the audience really responded to it in a way that I couldn't even imagine. Um, because there are people dancing in the space, they were really enjoying the space and actually they were kind of enacting a lot of the images in real life. And I thought that was so amazing. It's so uh, a surprise. I mean, I was. I mean, I know that I that was my my goal to represent these ideas um, through the work, but I was not. I wasn't ready for that, the idea that it would activate the crowd, which was great. But it was definitely a surprise in a good way. Yes. I would say we'll go down on record as certainly one of the best pre-COVID parties in yeah, Indiana. Yeah. <laughs> leisure 
but also about planning, about planning, about being, you know, strategy. Um, there, you know, I, I looked around on top numerous times when I'm with my friends and, you know, if they happen to be, you know, in town for various reasons that were gathered for whatever reason, birthdays, we start to have these conversations and I, and I look at these individuals and I see how much impact they're making on society and in the world and how active they are. And I realize that, you know, at that moment, that it's really about party and playing. And it's not just about one or the other. And I think that the world should see that and see that as subject matter and art and see the black figure um, in repose, in, in relaxation, in laughter, and you know, the celebration. Um, it doesn't diminish the other serious things that are happening around the figure. I believe that showing the balance of both is, is really is essential to talking about the complexity of the human experience and how um, deep this balance is very uh, health, healthy and normal. And these images, I feel, are not as um, as popular or as put out in the, uh, the mainstream media with art. And, you know, I, you know, it, you know there are artists, I believe, who are part of this conversation, um, like Terry James Marshall, one of my favorites. Um, but I think that it's becoming more common, yes, now. But I think that it takes artists like myself and other um, artists who feel that these images should be put out in the world and make a, a, a real effort to stand by the importance of these images in the world. And, and you talked, speaking about the impact and maybe a catalyst, when the exhibition Blaine was here, which has since traveled down to um, the MFA St. Petersburg, so yeah. congratulations yeah. on taking Thank your you. exhibition down to a new part of the United States. Um, we're thrilled that it traveled to our partners there. Uh, there was, you, you have mentioned an, um, that there was a particular set of photographs that really impacted you in, in, 19, in the 1967 issue of Ebony Magazine. Could you just help our audience who may not know about these photographs talk about what that influence was about that, that holistic, the, the holistic persona? Well, um, I was doing research on this subject of the floaters. I'm going to interrupt. Yeah. I'm going to get off. Excuse okay. me, everyone. As I said before, I'm going to remove myself so that Derek can take his mask off and speak on your comment. <laughs> okay. Oh. So, doing research, um, a few years ago, maybe five or six years ago, and thinking about subject matter and thinking about the relevance of uh, the black figure placed in a, in a certain in different context, um, all came um, solely from this image of Dr. Martin Luther King and his wife, Coretta, uh, in Jamaica at a resort, and they were all in the pool, floating. And I started, I saw this image and I realized how important this image was because this particular image uh, showing them in this kind of repose was really a very unique image compared to all the other imagery that you would see when you would Google MLK. Um, most of the images are of him and other civil rights activists um, in a environment of you know, um, conflict or dealing with oppressive structures in a way that was more iconic, even for myself and for most people who are uh, aware of who um, Dr. King is and what he represented. And when I saw this image of him in the pool, his wife, um, his leisurely, um, just leisurely um, kind of posing around um, in this article, I realized that this was the motivation for the photo series. And I started to think about leisure in a more contemporary setting, and that's when the flotation devices became part of the backdrop for the figure, or the prop for the figure. And then it connected to the Kansas party and plan. And you got this idea when you were on a Rauschenberg presidency. Am I correct? Is this how well, it started the genesis of this idea? It kind of came before, right before the residency, it started with a conversation with you when we started to think about the exhibition and think about 
uh, buoyant and we talk about this space and we talk about the possibilities of creating something that was a conversation with buoyant. And so I was just about to go to Rauschenberg for the summer to do a residency. And so the idea of this, the subject um, kind of came from our conversation, but the execution of it began at Rauschenberg. And that's where I kind of formed this idea because when you and I talked um, about the idea of the pool and the history of the black figures in water um, and in popular culture, I started thinking about uh, the pool house and how the pool house also became part of the festivities when you think about leisure and, um, and gathering. The pool house, you know, that can be found in private settings or community settings. They are not necessarily subject to any particular economic um, structure. They have them in, you know, at the Y, they have them in people's houses, uh, backyard. So I thought the pool house would be a great um, added um, component to the exhibition. So the party and plan came out of that idea. It's, it came out of the idea of being immersed in water and then from there being with each other and having this conversation around this kind of communal uh, space, which here is, is kind of a, a graphic of a table and uh, the DJ booth, the DJ, and people kind of around the table and, and, and the pattern and the wallpaper wraps around the space. So it's like a continuous party with everyone kind of in conversation with each other. And also, you know, everyone has like mixed emotion, like people do have a party. Some people are serious, some people are laughing. They're definitely in conversation with each other in some ways, but I wanted to show this um, side of, um, of leisure because I believe that this, this particular um, component of the exhibition uh, combined with buoyant added another layer to the ideas around um, the black figure in leisure and the relevance of seeing those things and understanding them as being impactful and a part of resistance in some ways. And, and it's really interesting when you talked about that idea of, of owning a space and, and a community center room is one, right? You come in, you really have generally a lost space. Yeah. You come in, you're doing a birthday party. Uh, we gotta bring everything. We gotta bring everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, like, you know, my family, I come from a big family.
Thank you. So, um, what we, can we talk a bit about actually the composition of the work? And I think our audience would be really interested in knowing what goes into making one of these works. Uh, because it, uh, what I've heard from right back from visitors when they walked in is they said, oh, wow, I, the, the photo didn't do it justice. Now I understand it when they come up in front of it. So, uh, can you talk for our audience about uh, what goes into making work? You know, like we're seeing. We're seeing uh, very geometric forms. We're seeing uh, tonality. We're seeing texture. We're 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 seeing a lot in this in, in a single image. Could you talk about that and how you made those decisions? Well, one thing that I uh, was focused on when I started making the work is the idea of uh, kinship, and kinship was kind of like a kind of defining principle as I tried to think about the compositional layout of the work. I created the individual images based on um, thinking about uh, body positioning around a table or around a room. And, and the geometric form has been something that, that I've in incorporated a lot in my work over the years. Uh, sometimes, you know, uh, the work's are looser and less um, graphic or less hard edge. But for this particular body of work, I kind of want to focus on the geometric form because I wanted to deal with the geometric pattern um, as it complemented the body. And so the geometric form of the figure, uh, I think, is are, are pretty much mimic in the pattern structure that I chose to, uh, I guess, to engulf the, the figures in, which um, the shadows and the spotlights were also part of the wallpaper, and I wanted to kind of pick up on those, on that graphic geometric form within the um, silhouette behind the figures um, in the collages. And so a lot of my interest in pattern have also been very much about social, political, and cultural um, specificity. And one thing that I really uh, focus on when I'm making these types of works is the relationship to the Black American and the African experience and how they kind of coexist in a way that is very complicated and also um, very productive for me because I look uh, at a lot of traditional African patterns and I incorporate those in my work as I do some more modern, more um, pop, um, I guess, arranged, dots and other areas that I feel are, uh, lends itself to the way I think about the geometric uh, form, as well as um, how it kind of resides in these spaces. Um, I actually think about a lot of these figurative works that I make as being very much focusing on abstraction and abstracting the figure, more so than representing the figure in its actual form, but kind of really thinking about the form as it relates to African culture and how it relates to um, some of the geometric patterns that appear in African textile um, and things like that. So I'm always thinking about reference to history in the past, but also thinking about uh, contemporary culture and how that plays a major part in the lineage of traditional African um, history, um, art making and craft, and how, for me, is kind of one of the visual and more creative uh, motivations for how I construct everything in my work, from the forms that are really you know soft and round and bulbous mixed with figures and spaces that are very uh, hard edge and geometric in form. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, this this exhibition has brought up. Uh, some really interesting conversations about owning a narrative. And I know you started to touch on it, but that's happening in a lot of work. It's, it's, a, it's a conversation that's going through many forms of art and, and many social equity conversations right now. What's your, what's your thought on the importance of owning a narrative? And are there any other, and, and how is, does your work fit in? And are you, are you inspired? Are you seeing other work that is, that you're feeling inspired by? About in that sense of people taking control of their own narrative rather than letting someone else tell their story. 
Oh, but taking control of your narrative is something that I feel is the most essential part of any creative practice when you have the ability to make something. And you want, and when you have the ability and the opportunity to make something, you have to decide whether to make something that is in de direct relationship to um, the problem, or you have the ability to kind of look you know, beyond those things and kind of pull visual um, experiences that you, you feel are even more essential for people to see in the world um, through, you know, even when there's things that are happening that are dealing with turmoil and oppressive structures, which are things that you can look at on the news, you can read about it. Those things are way more available uh, to the average person uh, to research to look at, I think, finding other narratives that are more in celebration of the part of your culture that you think is significant and important. I think those things are sometimes sidetracked based on the oppressive structures and the situation that we deal with, and so they come out and work. Um, and sometimes it's necessary, but I also think that it's room for narratives that will somehow empower um, the figures that you want, or the people you want to empower through other stories, other real um, experiences that we, we're having. And so for me, that's my focus. I think about a lot of different things, not just leisure. Leisure, I think about, you know, um, inventors. Uh, my show at Stony Island Arts Bank was based on an archive in, in the bank, and I use the theme of um, inventors and, and product designers as the, as the source of my collages in the space that was there. It's called Future People. Um, and you know, I did a show of that um, based on Victor Hugo Green and his wife Alma uh, Green, who um, orchestrated and, and, and uh, published the Green Book, uh, which was a tool for black Americans to travel. So I'm always thinking about history. I'm thinking about my position as an artist. I'm, I'm, I'm staying focused and on track, and I'm making sure that conversations that are not dominant conversations become dominant conversations. So I'm, I'm, I don't go for the first um, easy uh, like intro into talking about the black experience, which is, for me, I think, is uh, what we're seeing all the time in the, in the news. You know, the history, the real history that's, also, that's happening, but also I feel like it's room but narratives that support other um, experiences that we've had and, and other um, very helpful contributions we've made to civilization. Um, and I feel more excited about that in my studio, making those works, knowing that I'm trying to empower the next generation, to empower um, people who are unaware of this information. I can you know, use my work and use my visual language to push the narrative I want to be dominant. Uh, and I think about the significance of that in the future. You know, the downside of doing that is sometimes when you're making work that is about the thing that I make work, sometimes people don't look at it necessarily in the complexity that it really is because it has such a common and familiar visual language for most people that they look at it as positive. But in fact, the reason you say it's positive makes all the reason why it's a problem that to see black figures in leisure or repose or smiling or laughing is considered positive, but if the figure was not black, it would just be what it is. It would just be a subject at a party doing things. But because it's positive, it's, it, it actually acknowledges that there are negative images in the world that don't give you joy, that don't give us joy. And I think that, to me, is problematic. And until these images become um, dominant um, and part of uh, an ongoing uh, push for showing normal, normalcy within the black body and the black experience, that's going to be a challenge for us to kind of look at this work as, as com complex as it is, as I think it is. Mm -hmm. um, I would say to those following along, if, uh, if you would like to pose a few questions in the chat on Instagram, please feel free to do so. We'll check those. Um, and while we wait for some of those to come in, um, what, a lot of what you're talking about in terms of creating a, uh, a 
perpetuating a, a normalcy, as, mm -hmm. uh, right? This is, it shouldn't be exceptional to see uh, black figures enjoying themselves at a party because that's lived experience and yeah. you know it well and many people know it well, right? But that's not what, always what the mainstream media shows. And these are healing, I think. What we yeah. have heard from we have heard from visitors that they, the words that they have said are I feel acknowledged, I feel seen, and one person even said I saw these pictures and I began to heal. And I know you have a new project that actually is connected to healing, and I was wondering if you could tell us more about your new project, which is very much related to health and healing, and and in a hospital. Oh yeah, so um, I was commissioned to do uh, to design. Um, to create wallpaper for the Harlem Hospital Children's Emergency Ward. And I was really excited. Um, I think it's about six or seven rooms where the wallpaper is, uh, is installed. And it was, I feel, as an artist, th that experience or that uh, opportunity was the most um, defining part of um, what I, what I think that most artists hope to accomplish in their, with their practice, being able to make a really strong impact that will change the way people look at art and the way people look at visual language. I was excited for the opportunity to really think about the, the audience, which are children, and think about what would impact them in a way that will make them, you know, take their mind off of the fact that they're in a hospital, that they're maybe usually sick. One thing that the director of the hospital told me when I met her, she said, just imagine, no one who comes here wants to be here, number one. That's one thing to think about. No one's happy who comes here. And so you gotta think about that as kind of like the motivation for what can exist in the space. And so that was really an important thing to know from you know from the get and it really motivated the way that I thought about the work. And so I didn't really consider those uh, those those facts and that was a big motivation for the arrangement and the subjects that I created for the wallpaper. It, it's amazing how both a party and a scene in a hospital those are that those are so connected. We are have we are getting in some requests uh, for you to maybe do a scroll through the space if you don't mind. Maybe okay. we could um, we could actually sh we're going to do a spin through the space and if in addition to, let's do the portraits first if you're up for okay. that and then I thought we could also turn to this section of the exhibition that's off camera that uh, the okay. tables are turned. Does that okay. Sound good? okay. So you, so I plan to put the mic down. Uh, I think that's... Was it long enough? No. Um, can we start with a few right over here? Okay. And... Just put it right there. That's perfect. Start on this wall. Okay. So here um, is the beginning of the installation. And so, as you can see, this particular imagery here is a, um, a design of a, uh, a table setting. Um, this is the chair, the back of the chair. This is a tablecloth, this pattern that is repeated throughout the exhibition. And these particular figures that are placed along the table back and front suggest that they're either sitting or somewhat standing, but they're communing around the table. These figures here um, are all standing figures who are uh, positioned in front or behind the table. Um, this is uh, another figure. The background wallpaper, you know, incorporates uh, kind of the center block pattern, which is pretty common in a lot of community centers. They're usually painted uh, like, a, you know, a gray or blue or whatever the color that they use, but it's really a color that's more considered a neutral pattern, which I was really interested as an aesthetic for this work. Here is a DJ. These are the turntables. It goes on. We have the pendants right here, which is, you know, is, is, are captured in the actual wallpaper, but I felt it would be significant to kind of uh, reenact what's in the wallpaper in the physical space. So this is part of the exhibition. Um, alongside again with the figures here, I was really um, interested in using uh, various composition and posturing to uh, represent all of the, all the party guests. And these individual pieces 
either are just called party guests in that number. They don't have individual names. Um, I felt like it was really more about the collectiveness of the images in the, in the collages versus the individuality of each person in the party. And Derek, you have mentioned that um, before that not everybody is experiencing the party in the same yeah, way, like, in the same moment. Yeah, like this right here. This is like one of my favorite painting ones right here. This figure here, because she looks like she has mixed emotion. <laughs> and, you know, and also, you know, there, you know, when you're at a party, everyone's not laughing and have, you know, uh, in, in the life of the party. Some people are actually just hanging out at the party. And, you know, and also these are all adults and they have party hats on. So most adults, you know, take on a different type of personality when they're forced to wear a hat, like a party hat and, and, a, and an adult party. So, but I thought it was a way of kind of bringing the ego out of the subject matter. Yeah, I, I feel like when you put a party hat on at a party as an adult, you kind of, the ego that most people have kind of, you know, diminishes a little bit and everyone kind of are at the place at the same humble, humble start. So the hat kind of signifies that, this idea of like unity, regardless of, 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 of um, your hairstyle or whatever you're trying to wear, you know, like how you're gonna fit that over your, whatever you have on. You have there's, a, there's always one person who won't wear the hat. Yeah, they won't wear the hat, they won't wear the hat. You know, you gotta convince them to wear the hat, you know? And it goes around and then it kind of, it ends at this particular place. And these are two, uh, figures, freestanding, you know, like full-size figures um, standing on both sides of the wall, um, which I, you know, kind of like an intro to people who are at the party either coming in or or, um, or somehow observing the party or about to be a part of what's going on. And in the center of all of that are these uh, works, these uh, collage sculptural wall works are called Tables Turn. And this, these particular works, I feel, really epitomize what I'm seeing when I talk about the influence of kind of West African pattern with a lot of American pop culture, iconography, and geometric form. Because the thing that was the kind of uh, um, the main principle of organizing this, uh, these objects is the juxtaposition of pattern and how that, instead of having the figure uh, present in this work, I felt these placemats represented the figures in a way that the body would represent the figures without having the body present. And so the combination of, of, of geometric patterns that, uh, that are um, directly uh, influenced by West African kente, uh, which I'm really, I, I'm really uh, a big fan of, of the kind of really stripped down geometric almost like mathematical uh, arrangement of geometric form. is something I use a lot and I kind of use it in juxtaposition of some of these more gingham, more uh, uh, English um, um, concepts of patterns and, uh, and form with some of these kind of like polka dot structures. So I kind of use all of these uh, placemats as a form of having a conversation about the diversity even within the black experience. The black experience, I think, is such a multicultural experience because it kind of comes out, out of so many areas of the of the world, um, and there's a lot of differences as well as uh, commonalities within the culture in itself. And I think about that when I'm thinking about my work: how to have this conversation of lineage um, and diversity and uniqueness. Um, when I talk about the black experience and not to think about it as kind of from through one lens. I'm constantly always thinking about how to talk about the experience in a way that not, that's not flattening out the figure. You know, I think that, you know, focusing on one aspect of who we are is not necessarily the most productive way to really build the future of our identity and for people to understand that the complexity comes from the fact that it's based on so many um, cultural um, um, inclusions and, and, and cultural contributors that uh, <clears throat> when I look at my work, I see just, just the black experience as being something that is collective, collective culturally, and collective um, um, dealing with region, dealing with what's north, south, east, west in America. 
going from there to like Canada, going to other places to Europe, you know, UK, I, I feel like these works are representative of not just the black American experience, but just the experience of, of being a black person, being with your family, being with friends, and how that is such a <clears throat> revolutionary visual experience to see that and to see the benefits of that rejuvenation um, gap from gathering. So these particular pieces called Table Turn uh, are, you know, are uh, wood panel structures with this fabric and, uh, and other paper, paper products uh, adhere to this um, panel and then attached to the wall. And this is, this is the quietest this exhibition has been. We, we turned off the music that is yeah. normally playing in here. Now, a lot of your work, you are, I would say, fiercely multi and interdisciplinary. You often think about various mediums as while well you're creating work. So we've had music playing the entire <laughs> yeah. time. Um, I love that. And, so, and, uh, and it was, uh, again, that opening night, there was not a level in the museum that did no. not have music going. Um, what is, I'm going to ask this out to people who are following along, but I'm going to ask Derek first just about uh, music and, and thoughts on celebration and um, what influence it's, it's playing, it, what, maybe what influence it played in making this work or in your future work. What, where, does, where does song and music bring back memory? How does it inspire your process? Well, music plays a major part in my Music, music plays a major part in my practice. Um, constantly in my studio, I play music. I'm a big R&B uh, fan, I love R&B. I play a lot of it in my studio when I'm working. I sing a lot in my studio when I'm working aloud. Um, if you're there, you may hear me singing uh, while I'm working. Um, music has always been a, a motivator for the way that I move through the day, starting with more slower jazz when I get up, then uh, from jazz I go to more R&B. <clears throat> By the end of the day, I probably end up listening to more rap or whatever is more of a turn up for the day. So music does play a major part in the way that my mood shifts through the day in the studio. And, it, and I think that it somehow seeps into the motivation and the execution of my work and thinking about it in a way that you know, music has influenced the way we think about ourselves and the way we think about culture. Music is a big influence on everyone. And in the black community, music is a major part of, <clears throat> of just our lived experience. Um, there's always some type of music playing in my neighborhood. Um, and it's always funny because, you know, you, I hear people playing music out of their car. And it's so funny because I'm thinking like, that person who's in their car, I think that everyone wants to hear that music, <laughs> you know? So I think it's always funny to hear, to, you know, to, to think about how music is so influential to the way people think about um, themselves and the thing, the thing they think about, what represents who they are. And I'm always excited to think about music as a, as a big uh, component of uh, my process as well as, in this case, for the exhibition, it was in the space, the music, in the playlist, and having certain DJs came in, who came in throughout the show and played music. I felt like this was a really great collaboration in the way that you have these gatherings with your friends and family, because everyone who participated in the events around the exhibition were, were equally excited about the opportunity to be a part of this, as I was for them to agree to be a part of it. So I think that it was a great, it was a celebration, you know, beyond just the work. It was a celebration um, in the space just based on the willingness and excitement that all the participants felt for being a part of something that they felt was reflective and part of their culture and also a part of something that was progressive and something that was um, empowering. So I, I was really excited about all the people who came on board throughout the show, exhibition and participated. Yeah, we had it was busloads, um, <laughs> train yeah. loads. I mean, people yeah. came by every form of transportation imaginable. Yeah, it was amazing. <laughs> it was amazing opening, and you know, even even after we had like, the poets that came in and performed, um, we had some more DJs coming even when no one was there. DJ was playing uh, on IG Live. There was a lot of activity happening, even though we didn't have actual museum goers. I really felt like this exhibition radiated beyond 
the physical space into the digital world, and I and, and I saw so much so much um, activity online, just you know sharing images from the opening and um, and looking at the work and and trying to uh, get back in the space and trying to get in the space to see the exhibition, which I felt very honored and um, excited for. You know, I haven't been in the space since the opening, um, and I. Uh, you know. Yeah, how is it to come back and, and see an exhibition? You worked on it in your studio. You were here, of course, on the epic opening night. Was that, Mar was that March? March 7th? 5th or 5th? 7th? Yeah. Oh they haven't been there since March 6th. Yeah. And, um, and so it feels really great to come back and see the work with no one here, you know, not as many people as it was in the opening. And I really get to see the full uh, experience of my vision as an artist in the space because as this work was created, it was created in components, not all at one, you know, not all together. Um, the wallpaper was designed um, as I was making the collages um, and um, a lot of other elements were also planned um, as I was working on the collages. And so it all came together in this exhibition. And this was just for this space. It was created for this, um, for the museum, for Hudson River Museum. So I, you know, I came in for a site visit and saw the space and I was automatically uh, started to think about uh, just the space as a place to uh, consider um, creating something for it. And I think that the, the dimension and of the space lends itself perfectly to this uh, install. Um, one thing, uh, during since we reopened in July, uh, we have, of course, people coming back in and experiencing the exhibition. And when I have been able to speak with people directly, this is one thing they have said to me. Derek gave me my first chance at Rush Gallery, or they were coming in, they are coming back, <laughs> yeah. because you had given them a shot. Yeah. And I, would you mind talking about that? You, you have a commitment to to continuing a cycle. You have a, a strong mentorship yeah. value. And, and could you talk about that? Because the oh. people who came here yeah. freely mentioned that you had given them their first shot. Wow, okay. Um, well, um, from 96 to 2009, I think about 15 years, 13 years, I, I was a curatorial director for Rush Arts Gallery in Chelsea, uh, part of Rush Philanthropic Arts Foundation. That was a space uh, in Chelsea in the beginning uh, era of the, of the gallery scene. And I believe we were probably the third gallery in the area at the time. And I had started working there and organizing exhibitions. And I had the honor and privilege to uh, exhibit a lot of, uh, at that time, never uh, exhibited before artists and some new artists who had, you know, had some experience, but not necessarily um, known known as as well as they are today, um, and it was a great um, experience. You know, I had the privilege and pleasure to, you know, look at slides and look at images and um, and 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 choose artists to uh, include in exhibitions who are now you know established artists who are who are doing great things, um, and I felt like it was a great position to be in. I was a facilitator. And I enjoy the position of uh, being able to uh, include artists and to promote them and help them, you know, install their work and, you know, help, you know, work on their, you know, work on their press release, you know, work on, you know, programming around the exhibition. My job was very, um, was very flexible, you know, as a nonprofit, so I did a lot of the work. Um, we didn't have a mixed staff, um, and so. A lot of those artists, you know, they saw me at a particular point in my career as an artist, not really talking about my practice, but more focusing on my job, which was working at the gallery. And I still have those friends from that experience. And, um, and it was always about the art. You know, it was always about um, putting the art first. A lot of the friends I have from that, from that time are my friends, not before they had a show, it was after I had the experience with working with them, showing their work, getting to know them. That's how, you know, for the most part, a lot of my peer group kind of spawned from that time in my, in my life. 
So, first of all, I want to ask uh, Lincoln if, we, if there was any specific, uh, I know we've been answering a lot of the questions as they've come along. I wanted to make sure we're not missing any, I think we've been addressing a lot of them as they've come. Yeah, I don't think we have any questions right now. Just a lot of people saying uh, that they want you to come back and do another exhibition for us. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, now, one interesting conversation that we had back when we started this conversation and about what we were looking at on the Hudson River, we were talking about where we're from. You're originally from Baltimore, yeah. um, and I'm originally from Yonkers. And these are two cities that sometimes people want to make you feel like that wasn't a good place to be from. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And this room is a lot about embracing, um, embracing where you're from, where you're from, and yeah. oneself. And, um, so I'm proud to be where I'm from. I know that yeah. you are fiercely proud to be where you're from. Um, yeah. And there's a certain point in one's life maybe where you say, you know, I don't have to defend this. I know this to be true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and also you have, you know, when you know where you're from and you are familiar with all of the, the nuances from those, those, from that space and, and everything that makes up that space, you have a certain level of knowing and experience that's beyond what is surface and what other people experience through just a friendly uh, drive-through or a one-night experience, whatever. I mean, I look at Baltimore, uh, which is a big inspiration for my work, is um, being a very interesting place. You know, I go to Baltimore often. My, my mother's family is from Baltimore, and so I, um, I, you know, I, I go there often. I'm in the midst of organizing an artist re uh, retreat residency space there in Baltimore. And so um, I'm really excited about um, the city and going there and seeing, you know, of course, Baltimore, like a lot, like a lot of most blue collar cities have a lot of conflict with economy and, you know, and things that are not necessarily for the citizens, uh, citizens' fault. There is based on a lot of other underlying circumstances, but also there are people in these cities who are thriving and who are who are dealing with the unevenness of the economy. And there are just people who work. They work in the post office. They work for the state. They work, you know, they work for the city. They do different jobs. Um, like my family, most of my family are in um, state or government. Um, jobs in Baltimore and you know it's when I look around at them I always when I'm driving through Baltimore coming from New York I'm always looking at these really nice little uh, houses in the city which is you know which there are quite a few really nice neighborhoods in Baltimore and nice houses but I say to myself and sometimes out loud I was like why don't they ever show these neighborhoods when they do stories about Baltimore why don't they show these neighborhoods as super boring uh, a yes. lawn um, you know, a nice car, the house is clean, it's painted. Like, won't they show these parts of the city? These are pretty, pretty uh, dominant parts of Baltimore, too. So, for me, I'm always thinking about these things. Yes, it's more interesting to show something that is dilapidated and, and it fits into the stereotype of what people think about when you think about cities that are occupied by mostly black people. But there are parts in every city, like Yonkers in Baltimore, in Philadelphia, in places that also have really nice neighborhoods where the people who live there come out, clean up their yard. Um, they they uh, they they have nice neighbors. They're friendly. Those things are never seen in the in the media as much as the other things. And to me, you know, it's not an, it's not a mistake. It's not like by accident that these things are not considered the mainstream narrative. But as an artist or as a creative person. You have the power to redirect. You have the power to alter. Um, you have the power to uh, create other platforms for other conversations, and that's what I feel my role is as an artist. You know, some people believe that you tell it like it is, and you talk about what's going on right now. But think about what's really going on right now. Are there many things going on right now? You still have the power to choose what you want to make work about, and there are a lot of things going on good and bad, and I think that you can also have conversations about things that you actually are participating in on a daily basis, which most people are somehow in conversation with family members, 
loved ones, those things that you may think that they're small gestures, but I think at times like these, these are those kind of kinds of acts of, 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 of love and perseverance and struggle and those things are really important to also show. That is an amazing way, I think, to, I, I can't, no one can talk that, that <laughs> I'm not going to try, that's an amazing statement. And also I would say, uh, we have the power to click on what we want to click, right? Yes, yeah, so, we do, you know. Derek, this has been an incredible exhibition, an incredible experience for all of us at this museum. And I, I want to give you space right now just for any closing thoughts about uh, radical joy, radical black joy, what, where you're going, what you feel, just, just any closing thoughts for this final weekend uh, of this exhibition. Um, I, you know, this, this work and this installation is really about this experience or capturing this experience of planning, party and planning. I would like to leave the audience with this, with the idea that yes, you know, remember to always think about where you are and who you're around. Think about the idea of party and plan and how it fits into the narrative of the black experience and how seeing uh, a group of black people together um, is, is, to me, I think it's, it's always interesting. It's always um, a thing that uh, has always been a complicated visual experience for most people looking outside at this, these activities, this, this kinship. And for me, it's something that's really common. So I would like to say, you know, the idea of party and plan is something that is really significant, something that is really um, pressing, is something that is, that uh, we should be talking about more, um, and it's something that we do. So, um, I hope you're able to come down and see the show by, before, you know, by Sunday, which is the closing, um, and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you so much, and I want to welcome everyone in this, this last weekend here. Um, I'm going to ask Derek, actually, Derek, if you'll step back just for a moment. I'm going to take my mask off so I can thank, I want to make a special thanks, not only to Derek, uh, I want to thank uh, the co-curator, James Bartlett, and Laura Google for working together uh, so beautifully and, and for bringing so many interesting conversations to the fore during this exhibition. Uh, this is the final weekend here. Uh, we'll, we'll be open today, Saturday and Sunday, and so uh, the music will be on. Uh, come in, it's an immersive experience, it's incredible. Thank you, Derek, and uh, we'll see you this weekend at Wikane's Party and Plan. Thanks so much.